Hey everybody, it's Brian. Um, this tutorial, I'm going to answer a lot of questions that I get. Um, this isn't going to be on any specific language, it's going to be on actually all the languages. Um, if you go to my website and you just go to contact, um, you'll see that I actually am fluent in a lot of languages. And I get a lot of questions about, you know, you're only 40 years old, how did you get fluent in this many languages? And, you know, some people are like, only 40? You know, you're ancient. Other people are like, well, you're just a youngster, I'm 60, 70 years old and I'm writing code. Um, I'm middle-aged, let's just put it that way. Point being though, learning languages is actually very, very easy and I'm going to show you a real trick on how to do it. Um, if you go out to uh, T-I-O-B-E index, you'll see it's just a ranking of languages and this is based on popularity, based on search. And you'll notice that most of the languages have certain things in common. Um, for example, they're either C style or they're COBOL or VB style languages. Once in a while you get the oddball one like Python, but you could actually argue that Python's sort of a C style language when you really look at it. Um, you'll notice that C is quote unquote the most popular, followed by a Java, Objective C, 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 Sharp, PHP. So what are you looking at right here in the top? Let's just look at the top six. Well, they're all C style languages. If you know C, you implicitly already know Java and Objective C and C and C Sharp. Now, I know I'm going to get some hate mail saying Objective C is totally different, but really, it's Objective C. I mean, it's a C based language. Um, so, my point is if you know one, you pretty much know them all. So, the objective of this tutorial is I'm going to show you some just handy shortcuts. And if you go out and you also look for the most popular coding languages of 2014, you'll see some trends you'll see that, you know, like Go is 1.5% share of the market. Well, Go is a relatively new language. Well, Python's an old language, but it's only recently been getting hyped up, and now it's got 30% market share. And why is that? Well, it's easy to work with. Java is easy to work with. Uh, it's also 22%. You notice the harder languages, like the C++, the C Sharp, they're, and the Cs, they're a little less used. I shouldn't say less used, they're less popular in searches. So people like fast, easy languages. The thing about languages is no language is really faster or easier than the other. It's all about your knowledge in it. They just have smaller learning curves. You can learn Python in about two or three hours. You won't be an expert, but you'll be fluent enough to write a actually a pretty decent program. C++ will take you mm, two or three months. There's a steeper learning curve. So without further ado, let's just crack open the word editor here. Some things you need to know for all languages. They have variables. Now what's a variable? A variable is a scientific term for something that means it will change. So for example, my age is a variable. As you're sitting here listening to me talk, I'm aging. That's utterly depressing now that I think about it. I'm aging. Anyways. <laughs> my girlfriend's laughing in the background. Uh, another thing they all have in common is constants. If I can spell. What is a constant? Well, it's another scientific term. It means stays the same. Like a radioactive state of decay is a constant. Um, my gender is a constant. At least I hope it's a constant. I don't want to magically turn into a woman. Although I know some species of frogs will actually change genders. So. Gender's probably not a good example. Let's just stick with radioactive decay. Um, and then they have operators. Operators are like uh, what you actually do with a variable or constant. For example, you can add it, you can minus it, you can uh, say is it less than, is it greater than, you can and it, which is a memory function, you can or it, which is a memory function, etc., etc. So you're going to do something with the variables and constants. Well, now you have flow control. And without sounding like a commercial for Flowmax, you're going to control the flow of the program. And this is like your your if thens, uh, your else's, your loops, and select case, or let's just call it a switch. I'm partial to C style languages. And now you also have what's called a scope, which means where do those variables live? Now what do I mean by that? Where do they live? Well, when you make a variable, it has to live somewhere. It lives in memory on the computer. Well, a program sections off certain parts of memory into what's called scope. The scope can also be called statements, 
let's actually delete this. Statements, functions, I can't think and type at the same time. Statement, functions, subroutines, uh, methods, and properties. Now you should note some languages only have statements, some only have functions. Some have functions and subroutines, some have all of the above. Um, and then you'll have, last but certainly not least, structures. Oops, sorry, my computer is glitching up on me a little bit there. You'll have structures. And these would be data types, structs, which is shorthand for structures, enums or enumerators, and you guessed it, objects. Now, I know what you're thinking. Whoa, hold the phone. There's some languages out there that don't have data types. For example, VBScript or Python. Actually, they do. They just shield you, the programmer, from having to learn them, which is why Python is a very easy language to learn. Because you don't need to know the difference between a long, short, a decimal, a single, a double, double, wide, long. You just know that it's a variable. Whereas C++, you actually explicitly have to state it. So that's the basic foundation of every programming language on the planet. They all follow these basic principles. Some have more bells and whistles than others, some don't. For example, C++ versus the .NET framework. At the very core of the .NET framework, it's actually written in C++. It takes the C++ runtime. Now, the difference between C++ and .NET is you have a massive library behind the .NET framework. That's why it's called a framework, where you know, C++ is a language. So it's not fair to compare the two, and that's where a lot of people fall short. For example, people go, well, Java is a better language because it has X, Y, and Z. No, Java is almost identical to C++, just without pointers, but it has a gigantic framework. So it's more, I just shouldn't say it's more, it's a better comparison to compare Java to .NET because they're both frameworks. But as a language, you know, C Sharp versus Java, they're basically the same. Once you know one, you pretty much know the other. You just have to learn the language, which is working with structures, data types, objects, etc., etc. So, what we're going to cover here is if you look at this, you'll notice that most of these languages are C style languages. And then you have some oddballs like, you know, your COBOLs or your Visual Basics, and they have like a, a VB syntax. We're going to cover the foundations of these in this tutorial. If I can get my computer to, there we go. So we're going to do the C style first, because it's my favorite. Everybody has a favorite. And let me digress here a little bit. I actually, my first language is not a C language. People have watched my tutorials and they see there's a ton of C++. C++ was my first language attempt. Notice I said attempt. I actually did not learn C++ first. I bought a book, I read it cover to cover didn't understand it, read it cover to cover again, did not understand it, tried reading it cover to cover and ended up throwing it literally through a wall. I hated that book. Um, it just did, did not make sense. So then I switched to Visual Basic and it made sense. It clicked because it read like a story. If you're hungry, then go to the kitchen. Well, I learned a lot of bad habits in VB and then I went to Delphi, which is Pascal, which is kind of a mix between a C and a VB style syntax. Eventually I did land back on C++ and it was much easier because I learned the fundamentals that I'm about ready to teach you. Alright, so a C style language will have a comment. A comment typically starts with a double slash. Comma is strictly for your benefit. Basically means, hey, you can write notes to remind yourself what you did. When you declare a variable or even a constant, you'll have to give it a type and then a name. Now what's a type? A data type would be like an integer or a string or something like that. Now sometimes you have to do a little magic, like you have to put the word const, or actually constant, in front of it to tell it that it's a constant variable. But in the end, it's, I shouldn't say variable, it's a constant type, meaning it'll never change. So you'll have to declare a type and a name. Next thing you need to do is get into, well, you guessed it, flow control. And we'll just do the basic if statement. So it's if, parentheses, and I'll just do caps, that way you can really see it. If then, and then statement and then notice the semicolon at the end. So that is a one-line statement. You're just doing an evaluation if and then something and we're just going to say x. If x. x could be true, x could be y plus 10, I don't care. If something then do something else. This is an if then statement. You can also break that down into scope. Notice these brackets. That's indicative of a C style language. 
it's called C because C was really the first language, I believe, to use that kind of curly bracket syntax. A lot of people hate these brackets. I love them, and let me tell you why. Because it defines scope. Going back to what we were talking about, scope. What is scope? Think of scope as a hotel. You have a variable, and I'll call that variable Brian, me, and you have another variable, and we'll call it you. You have a hotel room, and I have a hotel room. You don't want me in your hotel room, and I don't want you in my hotel room. So that's scope. Think about that in terms of a language here. You are a ver1, you live there. Ver2, you live there. Which means ver2 cannot live outside of these brackets because you put it in scope. Now ver1 has what's called a global scope, meaning it can go anywhere. It can be outside this, it can be inside, it can be underneath it, wherever. And when you look at a program, you should actually think that there is a giant set of parentheses. So it looks like that. Looks kind of weird, I know, but that's called the global scope. All right, now, you know, we've covered if statements. So right there, what we've covered in this brief tutorial thus far is probably about, I want to say, two weeks of computer science class. So you're welcome. And now we're going to do a while, which, you know, should look very similar. It's got a command, if or while, and then we give it a statement x, and then you've got a scope. So while x, and we could say while my age is 40, while it's nighttime, while I'm happy, while I'm hungry, etc., etc. And then it'll execute that scope. Or you could do a do while. Now what's the difference between while and do while? Well, while will say evaluate it, then execute it. Where do will just execute it and then evaluate it. So you could say you're sad. If you're sad, do something. So it'll say while I'm happy, meaning it won't execute because you're sad. But let's say you're sad and it says do, and then you get what I'm saying though. It's going to execute this without you know, really evaluating the statement until the end here. Then you have a for loop. Pretty much the same thing, and this is typically broken up with those semicolons. And we'll say x equals something. You know, x is less than or greater than something. And then you're going to increment or decrement. Looks like ancient Egyptian algebra, I know, but it's actually very easy syntax. You're just going to say for and then, you know, some variable, because it's going to change, equals some value. And then you're going to evaluate it. This is basically an if statement up here. x is greater than, less than, equal to some other value. And at which point you're just going to increment and move on to the next one. So it's going to keep doing this over and over. It's going to keep executing this scope over and over and over until that condition is no longer true. And there's one last one I'm going to go over, and it's called a switch statement. Let me kind of move my notepad up here. All right. Think of switch as a gigantic if then else statement. Oh, that's one other thing I kind of forgot. Let's do the if. You can also add the else keyword. So if x, then do something otherwise, do something else. Notice how you've got two different scopes here scope one, scope two. All right, so the switch statement is very similar in function, but different in syntax. And let me explain here. You've got your evaluator, you're switching. Think of a switch as like a light switch. And then you've got a scope. Now in this scope, you've got a bunch of other switches. Can you see a pattern here? Oops, if I could type right. That pattern, of course, are your little light switches here case, case, default. So you could say case 1, case 2, and then default. So if x is 1, it's going to flip this switch. And you could think of this as a mini scope or a scope within a scope. If x is 2, it's going to do this. If x is 3, well, we don't have a case for 3, so it's going to do the default, which is this scope down here. 
that right there, boys and girls, is about nine weeks of computer science class. Um, pat yourself on the back. You now know the fundamentals of every C-style language on the planet, which would be C, C++, C Sharp, Java, PHP. Um, Python's very similar. Um, the real difference with Python is they don't have these brackets and they use indentations for scope. Um, but like I said, you can pick Python up in about two or three hours. All right, so now we're going to move on to the COBOL style or VB style languages. We'll say VB style languages. Now a comment is usually just a single quote. And to declare a variable, you would do the opposite of a C style. You give it a name and then a type. Sometimes you have to do a little magic in front of it, like say dim for dimension is what it stands for. Um, and then we'll say name as, and we'll say string, something like that. So it depends on which language. Some languages are different. Um, but just know that you got to do a name and then a type. If then statements are incredibly easy. If, let me do capital letters so you can really see it. If then, and then you'll do something. And there's just an invisible scope at the end of this. You can also do if, then, and if. Let me kind of break that up a little bit. And you would just do something in here. So you can see how you're building scope. And you would have, of course, whoops, my keyboard's not want to cooperate with me else and if so now you got dual scopes so you have if you know some evaluator like x if x then do something otherwise do something else and you could build that out indefinitely all right now you've got four loops syntax for these are a little different But you notice the basic structure. You got for some variable equals some value to some value, then do this. And in modern languages, they have a for each, um, which is called an iterator. Um, basically, you have a list of things, and you could iterate through them. But we're not going to really go over it because it doesn't really, it doesn't really exist in all languages, and it's drastically different in most languages. All right, so we got the for next, and then we're going to do the do while. And then you would, you know, do something in here. I'm just going to take this do something and copy and paste it right in there so you can see. Whoops. You're doing something. And then you're going to do the do whoops, loop until x. And this is the same principle. You're going to evaluate first and then loop, or you're going to just loop and then evaluate. So let's talk about a loop real quick. And it's the same thing with C style languages. A loop would be, you know, you're it's like playing hide and go seek. You gotta count to ten. So, you know, while X is less than ten, keep counting basically. Now VB style languages also have a switch, but instead they call it a select case. And then you'll just have your cases in here. You'll say case one, case two, case else. As you can see, it's very similar to the previous with the C style languages where you'll have one, two, and then you have your default. Whew, that was a mouthful. So you can see the comparison between the languages. While they may look drastically different, they're very, very similar under the hood. Um, a lot of people get kind of confused and daunted when they start a computer science class and they have to learn two or three languages in a semester. And I'm sitting here going, learning the language is extremely easy. It's just you got to bear in mind you have variables, constants, operators, flow control, scope, and structures. Notice how we have not talked about structures. Um, there's a reason for that because structures are treated very differently in each language. Some languages don't have objects. 
you've heard the term object-oriented programming. Well, that's a newfangled technology young, young kids are using since the 70s. Um, some, some languages only have structs and enums. Almost all languages have data types, although there are some real radical ones out there that don't have them. But when you do object-oriented programming, really what you're doing is you're making a structure in memory. Think of a structure as a blueprint, like you're going to build a house. Well, houses come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. Same thing with cars. You want a blue car, a red car, or a black car. That's where you get into properties. A property is just, you know, you're going to control an internal variable in an object. Think of a property as like color. What color car do you want? Now you understand what a property is, and you understand how an object works. Now, an object, and let's actually just kind of go through here. I could spell object. An object is just a scope. That's all it really is. We've talked about scope and we're just going to say the simplest form of object is called a class and we'll give it a name and then it's got some type of scope. Now I'm using the parentheses with the C style because it's easier to see where the scope is. You've got your start of scope and your end of scope. Now in here you could say void test. People always get nervous when they see the word void. They're like, oh no, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean anything. That's what void is. It means nothing. This is a function and it's going to return nothing. So that's the premise of a C style language. Notice how you also have the scope here. Parentheses are also scope. In here you would give parameters. Parameter is just a fancy word for a variable. You could say A, B, C. Each one has a different data type. And in here, you would have your flow control. If, you know, x less than 2, uh, two then do something in here. So really, all an object is, or all a structure is, is just scope. For example, you've got this class, and we'll call it class, uh, let's call it cat. Now, you can take this class and make a new class and call it dog. It does the exact same thing, has the exact same function inside of it, but they're two totally separate scopes, meaning they're two totally different parts of memory. They do two totally different things. That's called object-oriented programming. And when you get into object-oriented programming, it's very simple. It's very easy. Everybody says you need a high-end math degree to program. You really don't. You're really saying things like cat dot meow or dog dot bark. It's really all you're doing. And you'll see a lot of that in programming languages where you'll have, you know, object with a dot notation or dot and then something, which is that something relates to, you guessed it, a function. So when you look at these, it's actually very easy to see what's going on under the hood. I know it looks confusing at first, but once you really start trying it, you realize learning the language really isn't the challenge. It's learning the framework behind it. And that's why you buy these 2,000-page monolithic books. But what you realize is most of these books spend 1,500 pages teaching the language, and you've just learned it in this video. Well, that's pretty much all for this tutorial. Um, if you like this, uh, feel free to visit my website. Um, I've got a bunch of tutorials out here on a bunch of different languages. Um, let's see, languages, yep. C Sharp, Qt, C++, Java, HTML, VB, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can also uh, download source code, check out some projects, and donate so that I can help other people.